good to be here. Um, my privilege to introduce our speaker to you uh, this morning. It was a bit nostalgic for me because I've stood beside him in chapel many times here at the Master Seminary. It was 30 years ago in August that uh, I had my first class here at the Master's Seminary, and next to me in that Hebrew class was Timothy Sin, our speaker, and uh, he, um, uh, we became fast friends even before, uh, we, 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 even before we were verbs, right? We were there already with just the flashcards and trying to figure out how we're going to remember these words, and um, everybody needs a, a, a friend, and you usually find that friend first in your Hebrew class, and so... Uh, uh, Tim and I became fast friends back in 1993 and uh, went through seminary together. In um, 1997, uh, Tim was hired at the Bible Church of Little Rock to work with Lance Quinn as a youth minister, and he, over the years, took various positions in that church, and when Lance left uh, in 2011, he was asked to be the senior pastor of the Bible Church of Little Rock. So now, now from now, the more than 25 years, he's been a pastor at the Bible Church of Little Rock. He's a faithful man, and uh, he and his wife, Hannah, have five daughters. Uh, we we're going talking about them this morning. Their ages are 25, 23, 22, 20, and 10. So uh, uh, he is uh, just a sweet, a faithful guy who I'm excited to hear this morning and, and to sit here with you under his teaching. He's in a key location, and we're just grateful to have you, brother. Come. Please welcome us now. Well, good morning. Thank you, Brian, for that. My name is Tim Sen. I am blessed with a godly wife named Hannah and five beautiful daughters, uh, four who have made professions of faith in Christ and, and followed him in baptism, and one that we're still praying into the kingdom. Um, so in addition to being the lead pastor at the Bible Church, I consider myself the uh, minister of women's ministry as well with five daughters, and uh, the Lord has used them to refine me greatly. Well, what a privilege it is to be among you today. Uh, I remember and, and have uh, fond and affectionate memories of this place and continue to have that fondness uh, for the Master's Seminary. It was here that I was trained. It was here that I was equipped. It was here that I was shaped as a man and where other men took an interest in my life and uh, helped in my spiritual formation. So I would just say for those who are prospective students on the campus today, I know it's not possible for all to come here in person and relocate, but if you can, um, it is a great decision, a decision you'll never regret. And uh, to Brian and to the other faculty of the, the Master's Seminary, um, I am very grateful for your support throughout the years. It's not like I graduated and then they sent me on my way. They've continued to give resources, continue to give encouragement, uh, continue to send um, speakers our way. Uh, Dr. Boozness actually came to the hills of Arkansas and learned how to call the hogs, if you can believe it. And so the Master Seminary has been a wonderful partner and support in my ministry. It is a blessing when God knits the heart of a pastor to his people. And I believe that that's what God has done for me at the Bible Church of Little Rock. I basically grew up there. He gave me a people who were very patient with me in all my failings and all my learning. Um, he gave a, a people who sincerely loves uh, my family and I and who I can say um, as God, as my witness, I sincerely love and have the fondness, affection for. I, I miss them when I'm gone. And as much of a delight as it is to preach to you men this morning, I love preaching to them more. They're the people who God has entrusted to me. Um, and it is not lost on me the years that God has given me to serve in that place. This morning, I want to talk about the elements of effective and fruitful ministry not because I consider myself to be a successful pastor, but I do believe that God has allowed us to see good fruit from a long-term ministry at the Bible Church of Little Rock. I count myself to be an example of an ordinary pastor, but as you're faithful to the Lord, you can be assured that he will use you, that he will use his word to do his work in his people. 
as a young seminarian, as I left this place, I knew that I had been given pure, sound doctrine. I had been entrusted with the truth. I knew the truth, and I believed that it was right. After 26 years of ministry, I know that God's word is not only true and right, but it is effective to change lives. It leads men and women and children into the kingdom. It equips them for glory. It sustains and strengthens and establishes them in the faith. God's word continues to do its work of transformation as our minds are renewed and as we are changed from one degree of glory to the next. And so as we look at these two elements of effective and fruitful ministry, I want you to keep in mind that God's word is the tool that he uses along with his spirit to change his people. If you would take your Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians, we'll be looking at chapter 2 this morning, or at least a portion of it. I'm going to zoom in on verses 7 to 12, but I want to read from verse 1. Follow along as I read God's word. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. But we prove to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. This morning from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 to 12, I want to show you two elements of an effective and fruitful ministry. I'm deriving that term from the word in vain in verse 1, kenos, which just means empty, futile, vain, without effect, without impact, empty-handed. The apostle was saying that his ministry among the Thessalonians was not empty. It was not futile. It was not vain. What was it about his ministry? What qualities characterized it that made it effective and fruitful? And in fact, as Acts 17 says, turned that city and the entire world upside down. Well, in verses 7 to 12, I see two key elements. I love these verses because they not only talk about the role of a minister of the gospel. We are pastor teachers. Here, Paul talks about us being compared to a nursing mother and to an imploring or exhorting father. He talks about the two roles of ministry. We are pastors and we're teachers. We're shepherd preachers, if you want to put it that way. 
We must have a deep and abiding love for the people who God entrusts to us. And we must have a deep and abiding love for the gospel that God has entrusted to us. So he not only tells us the roles of the minister of the gospel, but he tells us the manner in which we should exercise and carry out our ministry. Paul in this first chapter is going to say, our message is true. He's going to say our motives were pure and sincere. I didn't want anything from you Thessalonians other than for you to be right with God and to know that you're safely on your way to his heavenly kingdom. His motives were pure. His manner, according to these verses, is gentle. So my question for you as we begin this morning is, man, I know that you're being entrusted with the truth. You know the right gospel. That is without question. But that leaves two more elements of this effective and fruitful ministry. Do you love God's people? Do you treat them gently? And can you before them, and as God is your witness, say, my motives and my life is pure and holy before God? Let's bow our heads and let's commit the preaching of his word to our hearts. Father, this is your word. And as these verses even say, your word continues to work powerfully in our hearts. Father, we pray that as a result of our time in chapel this morning, We might not only know your word better, but we might know the God of the word better. We love your word and we come with an eager anticipation and expectancy that you'll use your Holy Spirit and his sword, your word, to continue to shape and to fashion and to transform us into the image and likeness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For each of these young men, who are here this morning, you know exactly the condition of their hearts. You know the circumstances of their lives. You know exactly how they best need to be ministered to. And so Jesus, as our good shepherd, would you take your word and would you use it to both encourage, to comfort, to rebuke, to correct, to exhort, to implore us, to give our lives for your glory. And Jesus, would you make each one of them, as they go into pastoral ministry, one who reflects your image and your likeness, because you are the greatest lover of our souls and the one who is sinless and blameless in your holiness. Father, we commit ourselves to you and now your word to our hearts, because we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. A few just general observations before we plunge into verses 7 to 12. Notice that this chapter is all about the gospel of God. It's about the word of God. Verse 2, the gospel of God was spoken to you amid much opposition. Verse 4, we have been entrusted with the gospel. Verse 8, Not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Verse 9, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. And then again in verse 13, the word of God, the word of God. This is a passage about the word of God and the gospel. But notice that it also reads very much like a trial or a courtroom setting. In fact, what had happened is that Paul, after ministering in Philippi, had been literally chased down to Thessalonica. And during his about three to six month ministry in that city, he had faithfully been proclaiming the gospel first in the synagogue and then in the streets in that place. And the effectiveness of his ministry was born in the fact of the converts who came to believe in Jesus Christ and also in the opponents who began to slander and accuse him of ill motives. And so this reads very much like a defense. In fact, I would argue that verses 1 to 6 seem to be Paul's denials. He says things like, verse 3, our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. Verse 5, we never came with flattering speech. Verse 6, nor did we seek glory from men. Paul's opponents were trying to discredit the gospel message by slandering the gospel messenger. 
It's a good strategy. If we can show that he's ungodly, if we can show that his motives were less than sincere and pure, then maybe this Paul, who's now left Thessalonica for other regions, was just someone who wasn't interested in you at all, Thessalonians. Maybe he was just in it like the other traveling orders of the time for money or for sexual favors or just to gather a following around himself. So Paul, in the first six verses, is denying their accusations and claiming that he's innocent from all charges. He says, our message is true, our motives were pure, our manner was gentle and loving. And then in verses 7 to 12, he really moves from denials to affirmations. This is who we were. And the strength of this passage is that he appeals to the firsthand knowledge of the members of the church at Thessalonica, that he says, you know who we are. You've seen our lives. You've witnessed our ministry. You know these things to be true. And if I'm on defense, I could call you to the stand as my witnesses. And more than that, I could call God himself as a witness because he knows the motives of my heart. So here we've moved from the defense of the gospel message and the messenger to the declaration of genuine love for God's people, these assertions or these affirmations. And again, I see two in these verses. In verses seven to nine, I see Paul liken or compare himself to a mother's love and tender care for the flock. And in verses nine to 12, I see him compare himself to a father's leadership and moral instruction. Let's look at each of them in turn. What I want to show you is that you, if you would have a fruitful and effective ministry for Christ, then strive to have a godly love for your people, strive to have a godly life which supports your message. A mother's love and tender care. Notice verse 7, we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. This mother's love is characterized again by three things, a gentleness, an affection, and a self-giving, self-sacrificial lifestyle. You could say a cruciform lifestyle. As Paul reaches for an illustration of his ministry among the Thessalonians, what better illustration could be presented of gentleness than a nursing mother? Many of you have seen that. I've witnessed it five times now. But the bond between this infant, a completely helpless and dependent human being, and the mother is unmatched with any other relationship. What illustration, what picture could better capture tenderness, nurture, affection than that of a nursing mother? So we know a mother does everything for her infant child. She feeds the child. She clothes the child. She cleans the spit up off of their clothes. She changes diapers. She bathes the child. She comforts and consoles the child. She sings lullabies to the child as she puts them in the crib at night and usually gets up in the middle of the night to continue to take care of that child. Paul, the minister, is comparing himself to that kind of gentle affection and love. The word tenderly cares literally means to cherish, has the idea of a mother holding a baby close to her breast in order to warm it with her body heat. Paul states that he and his companions, verse 6, even though they were apostles of Christ and had great weight, great authority that they could have asserted, rather come with gentleness. Men, Christian leadership is far different than what the world would have you believe it to be. God's not calling you to be a CEO. He's not calling you to be 
a manager or a visionary, even though those are parts of the pastoral ministry and leadership. It's not calling you to be a professional. A nursing mom doesn't make sure that her infant child knows that she's in charge or that she's a professional at this. She just gives of herself. Pastor is supposed to be more than just a leader. He's a shepherd. He's a carer for the flock, a gentle, kind, considerate leader. It's interesting that God is never reluctant to compare himself to motherly qualities. He certainly reveals himself as masculine, God the Father. He is our God. And yet take, for example, Isaiah 49, 15, and 16. God says of himself, can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. God again, Isaiah 66, 12 and 13, and you will be nursed. You'll be carried on the hip and fondled on the knees as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. Jesus was not reluctant to apply at times a feminine figure of speech or metaphor to himself. Matthew 23, 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and yet you were unwilling. And what is true of the Father and the Son is to be true of gospel ministers, the Apostle Paul, Galatians 4, verse 19, my children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. Notice here that Paul's saying the first key to an effective ministry is to come to the people gently. No mother treats her infant child harshly. She's not domineering. She's not using the child to forward her own agenda or to gain a following. She is an expert on her child, what the child needs. And she's there to provide that spiritual nourishment or physical nourishment to it. Likewise, we need to be ready to provide spiritual nourishment to our people, do we not? But we need to do it with gentleness. Young man, you're becoming an expert on the Bible. And good, you should be. A pastor should know his Bible backwards and forwards, inside and out. I've been reading Thomas Watson's book, A Godly Man's Picture, and he says, a dumb minister is worse than a, worse than a dead physician, which I don't know which is worse, but it doesn't sound good to be a dumb minister. And by that, he's saying a pastor who doesn't know his Bible is ineffective and useless to his people. What are you going to tell them when they come to you for counsel? How are you going to disciple others in the flock of God? Where are you going to point them? To your own wisdom or to the wisdom of our God? Yes, you need to be an expert in the Bible. But when you get out into your churches, Become an expert of them as well. Know what level they can understand, what level they can drink in the word of God. Never tire of giving them the pure milk of the word, First Peter chapter 2. Again, I'm not talking here about Hebrews and how they were castigated for still drinking milk when they should have moved on to maturity and eating meat, but never grow tired of giving the milk of the word. What kind of mother in nursing her child would be pouring gallons of formula or gallons of breast milk down that infant's throat? They don't need to know how much you know. They need to know that you know the God of the word and that you love them enough to treat their souls gently. Paul also exhibited an affection for his people. Notice what he says about himself as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children, having so fond an affection for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Paul combines word and life and his ministry in Thessalonica. 
here, the word so fond and affection literally mean we have a strong yearning. We long for you. We have a, a warm inward attachment. Man, it took me years in pastoral ministry because I was so desirous of preaching the word and it had changed my life so remarkably that I just assumed the more the word that you give them, the better. It took me years to realize in my desire to study, to become more trained in the word, that people are not an interruption to ministry. They are the ministry. That people are not an obstacle or impediment to your agenda. They are your agenda. That is why you love them by studying long hours. But some of you need to hear that you need to study less than you do in order that you can spend more time with people. Remember the context here. Paul is defending himself. He says, I love you. And, and he points to them. He says, verse 9, you recall, brethren, that you're my witnesses. Many of you are training for ministry and don't have a specific flock right now in your life to call your own. But the people that you are ministering to you, would they get on a stand in a court of law and witness that you truly love them? that your heart yearns for them, that you long to be with them, that your heart breaks when they make sinful decisions, and choices, that harm themselves, sometimes ruin their families? Are you willing to give up on them when they stray? You know, many times we do wander into sin simply because we're rebels at heart and our depravity it's more important to us and our sinful choices than to follow God. But like infants, friends, sometimes people wander away from the word of God out of forgetfulness. They forget God. They lose sight of him. The world seems so present and so real. And out of fear, they wander away. If a mom leaves the room, an infant will typically start screaming does not have the understanding that mom's still there. Mom's going to come rushing in if I need her. Likewise, many Christians, out of fear, lose sight of God. They turn to whatever else, what other device they think will help them. We need to be patient enough to come back in to remind them, God will never leave you, forsake you. Turn back to him. Paul's affection for his people was remarkable for a couple reasons. One is the length of time that he knew them. Some would argue three to six weeks. I think it's more likely that it was three to six months. But whatever it was, it was a short-term ministry, and yet his heart was united to their hearts, having so fond an affection for you. We might say, how did he love them so deeply in such a short period of time? Was it due to their winsome personalities? Were they like cute, cuddly infants? Were they sheep that were cute? Well, unlikely. Like babies, church members can be very demanding. They will interrupt your time. They will interrupt your schedule. Like sheep, church members will bite you. They can be very critical and fickle in their support of you. Kind of like the infant whose mom has left the room, what have you done for me lately? Men ask God to give you a thick skin and a tender heart. Was it their winsome personalities? No. Was it their spiritual performance? Was it that they were a model church, Paul says? They were full of faith, hope, and love, chapter 1, verse 3. Well, again, unlikely because Paul also deeply loved the Corinthians and they were a spiritual mess. He also loved the Galatians, who were confused legalists. Christians often forget to practically live out the gospel and make terrible decisions. They need you to persevere with them, to be the faithful shepherd, constantly directing them back to their good shepherd. Some would suggest he loved them because they were his converts, and I'm sure that's part of it. To the Corinthians, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15, For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. But sadly, at times, those who we have led to Christ and even baptized will depart from the faith. 
We cannot continue to find our motivation in ministry based on how the people are behaving. Rather, I believe the source of Paul's love for these Thessalonians was God's love for these Thessalonians. Look at chapter 1, verse 4. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. Men, God's people should be precious to us because they're precious to God. We should deeply love God's people because God deeply loves his people. We should be faithful to them because God has chosen and elected them from eternity. Leon Morris says about this verse, Paul had come to see the Thessalonians as the objects of God's love and therefore as the objects of the love of God's servants also. All ministers should pray for God to grant in their hearts an increasing portion of the great love that Jesus has for every sheep in his flock. I love that last statement because it's a great way to pray. If you find yourself in a local church and you're not loving the people the way that Jesus would want you to, plead with him, petition him. Oh God, enlarge my heart. Give me love for these people. Teach me to love them the way that you love me. Teach me to love them the way that you love them. Man, you don't want to be a nanny in the church. You don't want to be a babysitter in the church. You want to be a mother who gently and affectionately cares for her own. Ask God to enlarge your heart. Ask God to make you a shepherd who does smell like the sheep and whose cloak is full of fleece and wool, having been among them. Third element of Paul's motherly love is his self-giving. In verse 9, you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. All right, we're okay. Saw the clock, and I thought it just said five till. Self-giving. He says in ministry, you should be pleased to impart not only the gospel of God, but your own lives. Now, I actually want to take this from the reverse. I've already told you how affectionate, how gentle you should be, how you should be among your people, and how you should be loving to spend time with them. They are not an impediment or an interruption, but we would miss the force of this passage if we didn't realize that one of the main jobs of the nursing mother is to feed her child, correct? And so I'm always suspicious. I'm always wary of the pastors or the congregations who say, I love my pastor. He's a real man's man. He's a scratch golfer. Or did you see that 10-point deer he bagged last weekend? Nothing wrong with those things. But the pastor who spends Tuesday on the golf course and Wednesday on the tennis court and Friday's hunting and Saturday's watching college football with his flock only to crawl into his study Saturday night is decidedly not loving his people. If I saw an emaciated and famished infant, I would worry about the mother. And when I see emaciated sheep, I worry about their shepherds. So yes, spend time with your people, spend it in profitable, beneficial ways. But you are loving your people when you feed them the word of God. Moving on, a mother's love, a father's leadership and moral instruction, verses 9 to 12. You recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behaved towards you believers. Just as you know how we are exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. In these verses, Paul speaks of a father's leadership by way of his personal example and his personal exhortation. Notice, first of all, his personal example. We're not going to delve into these and enlarge upon them, but he talks about his diligence and his hard work. I provided for you, you did not provide for me, Paul says. 
His ministry was decidedly cruciform, self-giving. He talks about his evangelistic zeal. I was proclaiming to you the gospel of God. But what I want to focus in on is verse 10. You are witnesses and so is God. How devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers. Again, men, as you get out into your congregations or as you currently minister to them, could they be called to the witness stand? My pastor is devout. My pastor is righteous. My pastor is blameless. Could you call God as a witness? Because he knows your heart. As you're studying God's word, don't neglect the God of the word. Don't just study to take tests and examinations. Study to become more holy, more righteous, more blameless. With respect to God, Paul describes himself as devout. With respect to other people, Paul was upright or righteous. And with respect to the world, Paul was blameless or above reproach. His enemies could accuse and slander him, but nothing would stick. He was like Teflon. People slung dirt, but it did not stick to Paul. His life was not perfect, but it was blameless. And C.H. Spurgeon says, a holy life is a powerful sermon. See, if your public ministry is nourishing the flock with the pure milk of the word, this is now talking more about our private life, is it not? Start with that first word, devout, holy. Young man, are you a fearer of God? What does that mean? Are you devoted to him, set apart, consecrated for his service? Do you see yourself as a instrument in his hand, a willing vessel, a pure vessel that the master can use? Do you love what God loves? Do you hate what God hates? Are you growing in a reverence and awe for the God that you know? Are you growing in your adoration, your devotion, your fidelity to him? Again, Thomas Watson says about the godly man, he says, heaven is in the godly man men before he's in heaven. Is that true of you? Is heaven getting itself into your soul, even in the here and now? Again, you're a champion for the word of God, but do you love and adore the God of the word? And do you seek God in his word and in prayer, not to pass an examination, but to know God? Young men, would others describe you as upright? righteous. They say, there's a man who tells me the truth. He's honest. He's a man of integrity. He is a whole person, an integrated whole. Who he is in private is the same of the person that he is in public. Are you sincere in your faith without wax? Or are you hiding some secret or cherished sin? If so, repent of it. And until you can give a track record of faithfulness and fidelity to Jesus Christ, stay out of the ministry. You'll do more harm than good. If your church members turned out to be just like you after following your example and imitating your faith, could they be more like Jesus? Can you call God as your witness that you live a righteous life? John Stott said, happy are those Christian leaders today who hate hypocrisy and love integrity, who have nothing to conceal or be ashamed of, who are well known for who and what they are, and who are able to appeal without fear to God and the public as their witnesses. And young men, are you blameless before the unbelieving world? I know that we live in a Christ-hating and Christ-rejecting culture. I know that many slanders, many accusations will come your way if you're faithful to Jesus Christ. Better to be persecuted and be godly than to prosper and be ungodly. But make sure that you're being persecuted because of your love for Christ, not because you're being a jerk on social media. And here's a word of encouragement. Notice that Paul does not point to any requisite spiritual gifts or abilities. Compare ourselves to him. Who am I compared to the apostle Paul? He doesn't point to any particular achievements or accomplishments or 
successes. Paul is not patterning his ministry in ours on our personal performance. Rather, he's patterning it by way of our Christ-likeness, who is more gentle, more affectionate, more loving with his people than Jesus Christ, who's more self-giving, and who implores and exhorts and nourishes us in his word, who's more fatherly to us than the Son of God. You're here today and you're saying, I do believe God's calling me to ministry, but I look at myself and my gifts seem so limited and small compared to others. It's not great gifts that God's looking for. It's godly character. Pursue and grow in Christ's likeness and you'll do great good for the kingdom. That brings us to the end, verse 12. Notice what a father wants for his children. Why do we as fathers exhort our children, don't do that, don't hang with that crowd? Why do we encourage our children, you did a good job, hang in there. Yes, you fell off the bike, but get up again and ride some more. Why do we implore them, trying to motivate them to do the right thing? Well, because it's not about building our church, which isn't our church, it's Christ's church. It's not about building our kingdom. It's not our kingdom, it's his kingdom. Nor is it, verse six, about our glory. Rather, it's about his church, his kingdom, his glory. He says, I want you to walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Men, if you have a motherly love for your people and a fatherly exhortation, an example among them, one that is godly and holy, you'll be a faithful shepherd preacher to his people. I tell people that our job is that we get to help people get to heaven. And the privilege for a shepherd is that we get to guide and walk along the path with them, just giving tours of Christ's kingdom. That's why Paul says, we proclaim him, admonishing every man, admonishing and teaching every man that we might present every man complete in Christ. Our job is not done until those beloved saints pass out of this life into the presence of Jesus Christ. And what a privilege to be the ones who are the tour guides on their way to heaven. Men, you don't need to have great gifts. You need great godliness. You don't need to possess a charismatic personality, but you must possess the character of Christ. You don't need to have a large following. You just need to have a heart enlarged by the love of Christ for his own precious people. Let's bow our hearts and our heads. Let's ask him to give us his godly character and Christ-like love. Jesus, when we come up against a passage like this, it has all kinds of effects on us. Number one, Jesus, it reminds us just how good you are to us. Just as we sang earlier, our sins are many, but your mercy is more, always more. Father, I can't preach this passage without thinking of all my failures in ministry, the people I did give up on, the people I did not love enough, the people who I let down because at times I was more consumed with either my own agenda or my own plans than I was with yours, the people that I neglected because at times I was too wrapped up and enamored with the world and seeking temporal pleasures rather than realizing that we're in a battle that uses live ammo. Heaven is real, hell is real, spiritual realities are real and only Christ and the gospel of Christ proclaimed by his servants is going to do anyone a bit of good eternally speaking. Jesus, where we fail often where I have failed often. Your mercy does meet us and is more than enough. Your grace is abundant and sufficient. And we know that ultimately you are the one who cares for your flock. 
So Jesus, give us a heart like yours. May we eagerly and voluntarily shepherd the flock among us, not under compulsion, but with the earnestness of Christ. And Jesus, make us those holy men who are weapons in your hand, those men shaped and conformed by the gospel and through the crucible of life and trials and heartaches to the image of Christ, so that when we preach as dying men to dying men, they might walk away not evaluating the sermon on how good it is or how bad it was, but rather knowing that they had a pastor who had fond affection for them and whose life always was pointing them to Christ. Jesus, we pray that you would make us men of God. We thank you that you've entrusted us with the gospel. May we walk in a manner pleasing and worthy of you. We ask it for your glory and in your name. Amen.